Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kenny, for the introduction. My name is Betul Durak from EPFL, and this talk is about format preserving encryption. It's a joint work with my co author, Serge Wadini, from EPFL. And more specifically, I will be talking about an attack uh, to FF3 standard over m small message domains. And I'm going to start with the concept of a block cipher. A uh, block cipher basically gives a method to encrypt a message of a certain fixed length into the same length of cipher text with a hardwired key. Uh, I show you an example of AES with 128 bits of block sizes. Uh, however, block cip uh, ciphers are somewhat rigid because of this uh, fixed length of messages. In order to relax this, a new notion called format preserving encryption has been introduced and took place in applied cryptography recently. Uh, NFPE basically is a cipher that encrypts a message from a general domain D into the same domain D. So it is basically, again, a keyed permutation, but defined on more general domains. Um, so these general domains typically are passcodes, social security numbers, or uh, credit card numbers in practice. And they are not necessarily bit strings or fixed lengths. And uh, more importantly, FPE is designed to work on um, small domains of messages. So for in the case of SSN, it's just 30 bits of message. Um, I can show you an example of FPE in practice with encrypted databases. Uh, here's a table of... A, um, table of patients from hospital record. It includes some sensitive information, the identity of the patients. And in order to uh, upgrade the security of this database, we can use FPE to uh, individually encrypt columns with independent secret keys. And it gives a transparent uh, way of encryption. So what I mean is that we don't need to do any significant schema changes or there, there will be no significant uh, changes to applications that are running on top of these databases. So. Uh, desirably, we like to use uh, already known uh, conventional block ciphers like AES to construct FPE. One way to do it is to, to pad the input to 128 bits and truncate the output. But this disables the decryption. So we still want to use AES because we know its security it has been there for so long. It's fast enough for practice. But maybe it's not that straightforward to use it. Um, having said that, I can con uh, classify the FP constructions in two classes. In the first part, we have provably secure constructions, but they are not practical enough for practitioners. So NIST has uh, published a standard about format preserving encryption in 2016, and uh, all the constructions are practical, but the, the security of these constructions are supported by uh, cryptanalysis, which is exactly the topic of this talk. And we have two constructions in, the, in these standards called FF1 and FF3, and they both are based on Faisal networks. A Faisal network, uh, it's a widely known uh, iterative cipher, basically. It defines a, a pseudo-random permutation on any domain. And in here, I, sh I denote the domain as D square because of the two branches of Faisal network. And basically, we have the input message. We divide it into two parts, again, because of the two branches of Faisal network, and we iterate through uh, the, the uh, Faisal network. Uh, each iteration is called a round, and the round consists of a secure uh, round function called, typically this is a secure PRF, and uh, a group operation defined on uh, domain D. <coughs> um, so, um, I'm going to talk about a different feature of format preserving encryption. Uh, it's FP is uh, by design a deterministic encryption because we like to preserve the, or, um, the size of the message on the cipher. So we will, be, we will have a deterministic encryption. And as I said earlier, it, the FP is designed for small messages. So it's very likely that we will end up having two plain texts trying to uh, encrypt it under the same secret key, and uh, the, the cipher text will be equal to each other. In order to escape from this, uh, FP introduces a notion called a tweak. And uh, as long as we have two different tweaks, two messages that are identical will be encrypted under the same key as two different ciphertexts. So uh, tweaks are very essential for format preserving encryption. And more importantly, probably, these tweaks are not the part of the secret key. So they are not secret. They are publicly available and under the control of the adversary. Um, so uh, coming back to FF3 construction, uh, to uniform and to simplify the message domains that we work on, I will focus on the Zn times the Zn, the, mess, uh, the domain Zn times the Zn, and you can see that the domain size is in this case n square. And uh, how round function is constructed is follows. We take the right half of the message, we pad it to 96 bits, and concatenate, the, concatenate it with the 32 bits of tweak. And this is the input to AES function with this secret key k. 
and output of AES is uh, reduced modulo n to, to, to truncate. So now we can uh, use modulo operation to truncate without disabling the decryption. So what is important here is that round functions uh, are supposed to be distinct to each other, and we, we want to use AES with the same secret key, but changing the tweaks, we will uh, obtain different round functions over here. This is the basic idea of uh, FF3 construction. And from now on, I will just drop the secret keys and tweaks from the notation, so don't get confused, hopefully. Um, so in the standards, FF3 has eight rounds in, as, a standard, uh, as it's standard, standardized, and the domain size is at least 100. In terms of security, in the standards, it's written that the targeted security is 128 bit. I don't know what it means. And the security of Python networks uh, also inherits the FF3 construction because Fison uh, Networks has long history, uh, dates back to early 70s, and uh, there has been some cryptanalysis on them, and the results still apply to FF3 construction. And uh, in addition to this, FF3 claims that there is a chosen plaintext security and even PRP security under chosen plaintext and ciphertext attack. And we will show that this is not indeed the case. Uh, I will divide the rest of the talk in two parts. In the first part, I will talk about generic attacks on Feistel networks. And I will specifically focus on three round and four round Feistel networks. I hope you don't find it very like small number of rounds because you will see that I will use it for, uh, FF, to break the FF3 construction for small message domains. And the, for small message domains, the attack will be practical. As far as I know, uh, this is the best known query and time complexity. There, there's other attacks to FF3 as well, but our results are practical for messages. Uh, good news is that we can patch the FF3 construction to prevent it from the present attack. So a little bit of um, intuition. Um, the question that we like to answer probably is the, about the round functions. So here there is a three round Feistel network with three different round functions. And the question is if the, these round functions are uniquely defined to encrypt the messages. So the encryption happens as follows. We take the right half of the message and input at the first round function and add its output to the left part of the message to generate the intermediate value C. And then now it, we change the direction uh, and we take the intermediate value C to the, uh, as, as an input to the second round function and we add its output to the right part of the message to generate the left, right part of the ciphertext. And continuing like this, we generate the left part of the ciphertext Z. And similarly, what we can do is that to maybe introduce an additional delta value to the output of first round function, and this, in, this uh, additional delta value will be transferred to intermediate value C. And since I want to have the same ciphertext, we can basically subtract this delta value from the, from the intermediate value to, before inputting it to the second round function. It will give me the same uh, write off of the ciphertext, which is T. And again, this intermediate value C still uh, has this additional delta value, and it can be the output of last round function could be subtracted, uh, delta value subtracted to generate the left part of the uh, ciphertext. And these two, all, all I'm trying to say here is that I have these two uh, tuples of round functions, and they give the same input output behavior. So not for just one specific uh, message ciphertext pair, but uh, it will be uh, the case for the entire domain. So maybe you can make the analogy to a coset concept from algebraic uh, structures, if that will make more sense to you. Uh, the, the, the outcome of this observation is uh, even nicer because we will use this. Uh, the, the outcome is that the output of one arbitrary input Y could be set arbitrarily for the first round function F0. And this will still help uh, give us a way to uh, have the same input-output behavior as original tuple of round functions, namely F0, F1, and F2. So why it is important? Because uh, the, the, uh, the goal of the adversary in our work is uh, to do the round function recovery. So the, ad the adversary will not be able to recover the true round functions that has been used in the Fison network, but we can, we can reconstruct the equivalent tuple of round functions. So this will be still valid because it will give the same input-output behavior as the original tuples. And another way uh, to look at it is maybe to uh, think of the codebook recovery. So without caring about the round functions, how they work, how they function, we, we just ha want to find a way to encrypt message, uh, get the input-output pairs without caring about the round functions. So these two, uh, the, these two aims for the adversary will be equivalent to uh, recovering the secret key. 
because we won't eventually need a secret key anymore. So, um, as I said, I will talk about the three-round Faisal network attack. As far as I know, there has been no work on this uh, in terms of round function recovery, and uh, our attack is known plain text power given to the adversary. For the four-round attack, I will use this two-round attack uh, to develop four-round Faisal network attack, and there is another work uh, to, to, to recover the round functions given by Biriko et al., but in their, and even better time complexity, but in their case, um, the, the adversary is more powerful than non plain uh, adversary adversarial power. So, for, to attack FF3 construction, we exactly need non plain text. We cannot assume stronger uh, adversarial model. And uh, our work also can be generalized to more uh, number of runs, five, six, maybe more, uh, as opposed to be recovered all results that cannot be applied for more than five rounds. Um, so, the sketch of our uh, three round FISA network attack as follows. The input to the adversary is a set of message ciphertext pairs, no non message ciphertext pairs, and we call this set as S. And the, the adversary tries to recover the round functions even fully or partially. So it could end up with partial recovery of all these tables, F0, F1, and F2, or full, full of them. And we will analyze theoretically like how, when, when it is going to be full, when it is going to be partial. So I have the three round FISAL over here again. In the first step, uh, the adversary picks arbitrarily a pair, x0, y0, z0, and t0, and uh, I, I, show, I show you the equations that he, it can use, but we don't know the intermediate, intermediate value. The adversary doesn't have information about this, but uh, using the uh, outcome of our intuition, we can set one arbitrary output of arbitrary input in f0. I do this uh, mapping of um, f0, y0 to 0. So we are free to do that for one input, one single input. And from now on, we can use these equations to fill the tables of f1 and f2 on one point, namely c0 and t0. And the second step, the, uh, the adversary now knows how to evaluate f2 of t0. And now it can pick the uh, message ciphertext pair from set S which, match, which has the matching uh, right half of the ciphertext because it knows how to evaluate this F2 on point T0. Okay. And now the adversary tries to decrypt the backward using the again same equations, but from now we use the last equation over here, like F2 T uh, equation over here, and it will fill the tables, for the, uh, for tables of F0 and F1 for the points for this given uh, pair X1, Y1, Z1, and T1. And again, similarly, now the adversary will, uh, will pick uh, another pair of message, another message ciphertext pairs, which has matching right half of the messages. And uh, since it knows how to evaluate, on, uh, this point, uh, how evaluate F0 on these points, it will be able to recover the rest of the points for this given pair. So the idea is to, uh, to, to, to go back and forward, back and forth between F0 and F2 by filling the intermediate values of C1 for the uh, F1, second round function F1. So we will continue like this until no more uh, values will be revealed for, for the tables. And um, we will end up with the partial uh, tables or fully recovered tables. And why this works is uh, could be modeled as a bipartite graph from like now, I will try to justify why this works, why this algorithm works from a theoretical point of view. For that, we, I will model it with bipartite graph. And for this bipartite graph, I have two vertices, two set of vertices, which includes all the possible values for uh, y value, which is the right half of the plain text, and all the possible values uh, for the t value, which is the right half of the cipher text. So the edges will be defined with this input set S. And uh, we put an edge between, uh, between y and t value whenever uh, they appear in the set S. Okay. So what the algorithm does is that it starts with uh, one arbitrary input y0, and it follows, the, uh, follows an edge from y0 to t0. Remember, in the tables, we fill the, the points of y0, c0, and t0 for the first, second round, third round functions. And from t0, we moved to another uh, right half of the message, which was uh, y1 in the previous slides. And then we continue back and forth between y and t values. And all we are trying to do is to look for a big connected component in this uh, bipartite graph. And since what we know about with this bipartite graph now, since uh, it's a Faisal network, it defines a Faisal network, it's supposed to be secure and PR, having PRP security, which should be indistinguishable from random uh, looking like permutation. This, this graph should behave like a random graph. 
And from random graph theory, we know that this, this graph is fully connected with high probability if the set of number of edges, which is the size of S, is lo n log n. And again, even uh, when it is not fully connected, it, we, we could have some giant connected component. And in random theory, again, says that this is highly likely when the size of the S is n. So we have a nice uh, gap to play around. Even, we, even though we don't succeed to have the full recovery of tables, partial recovery would be probably helpful to, to attack the uh, FF3 construction. So I, I have the experimental results over here. And the uh, size of the S is parameterized as delta value, and data values are shown on the x-axis over here. And uh, I have two classes. In the thin lines, I show you the fraction of recovered f zeros depending on theta values. Maybe the, the behavior is that uh, the, uh, the fraction of recovered f zeros are, do not really depend on the uh, n value. Uh, over here, if you can see. And the thick values, thick lines, are the fraction of experiments out of 10,000 experiments, which fully recovers all the round functions. So no partial recovery, but full uh, recovery. And this matches what uh, theoretically we were uh, saying in our work. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, four round Fizer network attack, but I'm not going to spend much time on it because it's less intuitive, a lot less intuitive, and more details involved. Uh, it's not uh, very simple to explain. Um, uh, but the question that we were wondering and trying to answer was that, uh, can we characterize F0, the first round function in the four-round Feistel network, in a way that we uh, recover some intermediate values uh, C? As soon as we recover all these C values, intermediate values, we will be able to apply our non-plain text attack on three-round Feistel networks. So this, this was the whole idea. So it took quite a, lot, a, a long time for us to discover this uh, attack. But uh, as soon as we, correct, we find a way to characterize F0, we are good, good to go. Um, and I can show you some experimental results. Um, I have n as the, the domain size to the round function, not to the Feistel network, to the, to the round function. And m is the data complexity, query complexity uh, to the Feistel network. And I have some number of trials. The probability success uh, shows that uh, with, with what probability we fully recover the round functions for, for, for round Feistel networks, not partially, but fully. So as you can see, when n gets larger, the pro success probability gets higher. Of course, the time complexity gets higher as well. So we couldn't run it for, uh, for larger, larger than uh, 2 to the 18, uh, the domain size of 2 to the 18 for Feistel network. But uh, this, is, again, matches what we theoretically justified our results for the four-round Feistel network attack. Um, having said that, now we can uh, go back to FF3 construction. And in here, we need to be careful about the... Uh, I, I, I talked to you about how the tweaks are used specifically for the FF3, but uh, there is some more specifications, the, the, the way tweaks are used in FF3. Uh, so FF3 takes an input tweak, T, and it divides it into two halves, left and right halves. And for the even number of rounds, the, when the indices are uh, even for the Feistel network, it uses the right tweak, and when the number of uh, rounds the indices of rounds are odd, it uses the left tweak. But still, uh, it needs to separate all the domains. So we don't want to uh, have the same tweak for the first round function and the third round function. So in order to prevent this, they uh, XOR the tweaks, t uh, right tweaks or left tweaks, with the round indices. So this is basically, in the literature, this is called uh, pairwise different round functions. But the, the, the construction, tries to, uh, to, to so separate the domains with this idea, but we don't know how secure it is. And uh, indeed, uh, okay, so before that, uh, this work, uh, we have a chosen plain text and tweak attack for FF3 construction with given, given query and uh, time complexity. Um, so it's a round function recovery again. There's another work given by Bellar et al., but I don't think it's, it's so fair comparison uh, because of the, the techniques that uh, are used, different, uh, different techniques in two different papers. We, we, make more, we take more traditional approach, like round function recovery is more traditional approach than uh, the security notion that Bellar defined. Um, and also, we were really interested in finding a, a query complexity which is less than n square. So the n square is the the size of the domain. If you make more than n square queries, basically, I mean, you, you, you can get the 
code book, entire code book with n square queries. So our aim is to do it a little bit less than or uh, better than n square query complexity. And the number of tweaks we use is two over here. Um, so, so the idea of Python FF3 attack is maybe called a slide attack because uh, this is FF3 with tweak T and I can show you another FF3 with tweak T prime which is exactly the, taking the old tweak T and XORing it with four. So what is happening over here is that with XORing the old tweak that we have used for another construction, we can permute the round functions because tweak can be XORed to something and then they will be XORed to the round indices. So we can play around with this and it gives a, like many other permutations than, uh, than uh, many other permutations than this specific one. So what is happening in this specific one is that they have the same uh, halves as I can show you here. I, there is a G function that I will call it as a four-round Faisal network with tweaks uh, T, uh, TR XOR 0, T, TL XOR 1, and so on. And the upper part of the left side matches the lower part of the right side. And again, similarly, the upper part of the right side matches the, the lower part of the left side. So this kind of gives a little bit idea about maybe a little bit of a meet in the middle type of attack, but this, this is a slided uh, Faisal network. It uh, just uh, exploring the tweak bit four. And what we can do is the following. Uh, we start with an arbitrary input, uh, x, y, zero, one, and we apply a chain encryption to this with the, the secret key k and the tweak t. So this is basically h of g, I will define in short. And I will do it for many other arbitrary plain text, starting with many other plain text. As you can see, this is a chosen plain text attack, not, not uh, non plain text anymore. And what we can do is the same thing for the other tweak, which is uh, tx sort with four. And now we just, what happens over here is just to swap the g and h function that we apply here. So now we take two segments from left part and with, with, the, with the encryption uh, under tweak t and encryption under tweak, x or, uh, tweak tx sort with four. And the key point over here is that the adversary wants to find a mapping of x, y, i, j to x, y bar i prime zero under this function g. As soon as that happens, as soon as the adversary discovers this, the rest will follow basically pretty, pretty forward because we apply the chain encryptions of uh, uh, swapped g and h functions. And the rest will be recovered. What is happening here is that the adversary is able to collect non plaintext ciphertext pairs that is going to be the input of our four round Faisal network attack. So we reduce to eight round attack to the four round non ciphertext plain, plain text ciphertext attack. Okay. And the, maybe the question is that how, how the adversary gets this first, very first mapping? Well, the, we, we applied a very trivial uh, way. So the adversary tried for each pair. So the, it tried each pair and assumed that these pairs gives the mapping under function G. And then it tried to continue the four round Faisal network attack. And if it's, if it, fails, it will start again, start over again with another pairs. So this was the idea. And maybe because of that, the complexity is a little bit higher, but maybe there will be some more neat ways to, to let the adversary, adversary to, to come up with the first mapping of like x, x y, uh, i, j to x, y bar, i prime zero. Um, so now what is uh, in theoretical uh, perspective, we are trying to find that these two segments taken from the, these two uh, encryptions uh, of length b, b is the size of the chain again, uh, when these two uh, initial points of these segments will be overlapping on m points. Why m? Because m was the, um, uh, the complexity of our four round Faisal network attack. To, uh, to apply it, we need exactly m points. And the probability is uh, given here, and, it's, uh, we, we tuned uh, the parameters in order to get this uh, probability very high. So we, we picked our B and A based on this. So the experimental results as follows. Um, again, N is the domain uh, size of the, to the round function, and M is the query complexity to the four round Faisal network attack uh, with parameter L, and L is set to three for experimental results, but in theory, if you get larger L, it will be uh, giving much better probability of success. And A was the number of uh, arbitrary plain text to apply the chain encryption in the algorithm, and B is the length of the chain. Um, so 
In here, if you want to have a secure FFT, if you want to use the FFT in a very secure manner, then you can go with encrypting uh, maybe two, three bits. It's fine because our attack couldn't succeed to recover anything for the n equal to two. But then it gets larger, when it gets larger, the probability of success, which is the full recovery of all the round functions, eight round functions, was uh, getting higher, which is uh, getting close to one, even for a bigger parameter of L. But for the experiments, it was around 78% uh, of the time we were able to recover fully, fully recover all the round functions. So the I, I'm going to conclude the, the, the talk saying that, stating that maybe, maybe we need to work a little more uh, on Faisal networks with such a small domains. Uh, maybe some other techniques will work as well. You don't know. And the good news is that the FF3, even though FF3 suffers with bad domain separation, uh, there's a very quick, simple patch that uh, b this is basically the concatenating tweak with the round indices instead of XORing it. So our attack won't work in that case. So thank you so much for your attention. Okay, we have a little bit of time for questions, so I would invite um, people from the audience to come to the mic if they have a question. Um, while you're thinking of one, let me, uh, let me ask one briefly. Um, obviously, you broke here a, a NIST standard or found new attacks against a NIST standard. Can you explain a little bit the process you went through with NIST and how they reacted to your work? Um, so, uh, we submitted our paper first, and then we uh, emailed NIST about the results. And in the first uh, couple of months, probably, they didn't reply back. And uh, uh, probably it was because of uh, my bad uh, uh, write-up that I sent them. <laughs> so it was a little bit tough to figure out what is going on, because it was all theory. There was no like, slides like this to explain briefly what is happening. And, uh, and then they get back us. They said, uh, OK, so I think they need to look at the standards again and prepare some announcements about it. And then they invited me to NIST to talk about it. I talked about uh, the attack. more. Uh, details with more details around two, two and a half hours, <laughs> uh, and then uh, they they made an announcement about it. So, are, are NIST planning a new version of their standard to, to uh, yeah, I introduce think so. new yes. techniques or yes, okay. rising. Any other questions? And by the way, this oh. is also in a, a NC standards. It's not just NIST standards, and yeah. NC is also considering to 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 revise their uh, standards. I have a question about what sort of security notion we want for these very small. Things. If, if we're encrypting two bits, we're yes, not going to want absolutely. it. We're going to learn the whole table. The, so don't we want a tweakable notion where we can't tell for different tweaks, say different rows of the database, what the functions are? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very great, great point. At the very, very first time, I wasn't even able to understand what the security should mean because it's such a small domain size. Even with tweaks, we don't, we don't, we won't make uh, much sense. But yeah, I, I really don't know the answer to that question. So we should maybe talk to people that that want so badly we, should, we need FPE, so. Okay, thank you. Um, let's thank uh, Betul again for a great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>